Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the virtual breakfast sessions. My name is Larry Sashin, and boy, today we have a great group here to discuss something that's very, very important to everyone who walks into a restaurant, food safety. And uh, we're going to ask the restaurateur, is it part of your everyday menu? Let's go around the room and introduce ourselves. So Guy, why don't you kick it off? Fantastic. Hey, great to be here. Thank you, Larry, for having me. I'm uh, Guy Achiav. Just go by Guy Easier. I'm the president here at SmartSense. SmartSense is an IoT platform for food quality restaurants and groceries. Uh, we have a software and hardware combined technology that looks for uh, temperature monitoring, humidity, different type of gases like ethylene for ripe fruit, uh, the dish pack for temperature and the, the, the water. But what we like to talk about is not the sensors, it's actually the operational because we're all humans. Sensors are just data collectors of data development. And so uh, what do you do with all of this data? Well, you have a workflow, people are working in the kitchen, people are servicing customers and clients. And the whole idea is to serve better, higher quality, and uh, be more FaceTime, have more FaceTime with the clientele. And that's what we thank allow you. them to do. Thank you, thank you. Julio. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Julio Garcia. I am a, um, I work for a whole bunch of different companies, all in the produce industry, uh, business development for uh, produce experience. We're a grower, shipper, packer, mostly of uh, herbs, we have GMC Imports, which is an import company out of Ecuador, and we have a cash and carry just outside Hunts Point, NYC Tropical. Um, my end of it, I'm certified in um, SQF, uh, which is the highest certification for food safety in the produce industry. I'm also HACCP certified, uh, and I also have a third party uh, certificate from Safe Food 360. So um, as far as I go in, in the, the food safety, and produce goes, um, you know, I'm your man for that kind of stuff. I took courses down in Atlanta and, and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Christian, introduce yourself, please. Unmute. All right. I'm off mute. So I'm off to a good start. Good morning, everybody. My name is Christian Feglia. I am the property general manager at the New York Historical Society located on 77th Street in Central Park West. Um, we have three different um food and beverage, beverage outlets here. We have our restaurant, our a la carte restaurant, Storico. Uh, we also have our cafe parliament. And then uh, we are responsible for all of the food and beverage operations uh, within the, the historical society. So i.e. Um, catered events, weddings, uh, fashion shows. Um, there are multiple departments within the historical society. So we could do anything from a breakfast drop off or a lunch for education or the research and development team. And this is my partner, executive chef Ali Lugzada here, who spearheads <laughs> um, all of the food and beverage um, production. He oversees the culinary team, uh, ordering, um so uh, that's pretty much it uh thank long you version, long version long thank you thank you thank you bob say hello to everybody uh, absolutely thanks for having me larry and fred and uh my name is bob paranello i'm the owner of plum safety which is a uh safety and hospitality training company we uh we're based in new york little upstate new york and um we provide all sorts of, you know, food safety certifications, HACCP certification, responsible alcohol service, uh, allergen and, and gluten-free certifications as well as a bunch of other just occupational health and safety uh, OSHA related things. So uh, that's my company. We have a, a lean team, but we go anywhere in the country. Uh, in addition to that, I'm a public health inspector in Bethel, Connecticut. My director is very flexible, so I'm here. I'm here right now. I'm here when I when I uh, can be around my 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 company, uh, and I'm also an adjunct instructor at CIA Culinary Institute, uh, teaching food safety. Been there about 15 years, so uh, happy to be here and uh, hear all your you know issues and and food safety is my is my thing. Okay, so. thank you, thank you. So I'm a diner. 
and dine to me food safety is very very important um, we have an expectation that when we show up at a restaurant or an event that the food we put in our mouth is not going to kill us so so um, his, is Ali there or is he just hiding in a corner Ali yeah you know as a diner the world considers that the the dining world revolves around the chef revolves around the chef you are the person that touches our food numerous times before it gets on our plate all right a how important is food safety to you and what are the steps that every chef should be taking to uh, to ensure that what you put on a plate doesn't make me sick so basically it, it all starts from when the food walks in the door um when the delivery guy comes in, we check, make sure the, our receiver checks to make sure the fridge is refri refrigerated. The truck that he's bringing it on is refrigerated because that's where it starts from. And then it starts to, as it sits out, you know, as it's coming down the loading dock, it's walking in the kitchen, uh, getting put away, checking the invoices to make sure nothing is damaged, nothing is broken, the temperature is good, everything weighs accurately. Uh, so as we start putting it away, we want to make sure there's there's contact, but the least amount of contact. So I don't want it to, like, if I have raw chicken, I want to make sure it's out of the bag, not sitting in the juices that it's sitting in, because it's probably sitting in there for, like, several days already. So we pull everything out, inspect all the meats, proteins. It doesn't smell. It's not slimy. Uh, same goes with fish. When we get in whole fish, we make sure the eyes are not red, the gills are not muddy or uh, discolored. And the flesh is firm, the scales, it has all its scales on. So there, there's a lot of steps that we take before we actually get something and approve it and keep it in-house. And once that comes in-house, then it's, again, food safety-wise, it's how who's handling the food, how much experience the person has. I'm not going to tell my intern to jump on, you know, meat fabrication or chicken fabrication. All the proteins are handled mainly by me. And then if I feel comfortable with one of my soldiers or one of my right-hand guys, I will train them to make sure they know the proper steps on how to butcher it. And, um, and my sous chefs uh, obviously know. So when he's here, he jumps on that and makes sure that he's taking uh, tackling the protein that we have in-house. And then again, it also goes through dented cans and making sure there's no holes in the bags. There's, so there's a few steps that we take in-house we have our own little, um, I actually pulled this out because we're due for inspection anyways. So I have kind of a, a breakdown of my sheet that I go through on a daily basis of from, from hot holding to cold holding to refrigerations to trash removal. So that also adds into safety as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for supplying me with two segues here. So the one of the first things you mentioned was temperature and controls. Uh, Guy, I think you have something to say about that. Yeah, Ali made it uh, sound very easy. And, 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 and it's, you know, you're only as good as your supplier. Let's start with that, right? The flow of food. When you're receiving it, you know, want to make sure that you're receiving the top quality. Uh, so food traceability is key. You know, the truck that comes in, a lot of also grocers, not just restaurants, when the truck comes in and you check, even with the IR gun, you check the temperature right there and then, you don't know if the truck stopped in the middle of the desert somewhere in Phoenix for, for two hours and shut down the air conditioning and shut down the, uh, the, the temperature, you know. Uh, but so food traceability, number one, is key, specifically with any outbreaks of, you know, salmonella and uh, listeria and other other crazy stuff that we heard about in the news, uh, because temperature can actually make it more healthy, not just the coolest, but the flow of food from the receiving lane to the freezer, to the refrigerator, to then how to make the food, the paper. Is the, that, that Ali just shared with us is exactly how you should you should do it. With the lack of staffing, when a new staff comes in, you need to do all the training. Well, with a staff 
turning around so quickly as we see it today with the labor workers. Hello. Oh, he froze. He froze, he froze. Yeah. Okay, okay, um, Julio, while he's unfreezing. Um, if you can, have any device. Oh, he's back. He's back, he's back. <laughs> okay, you froze, so we missed, you, we, we heard about the laborer and then you froze. Okay. So can you pick so, up on that? Yeah, absolutely. So with a uh, turnover of labor, right, you need to be able to bring up to speed new temp workers or new workers uh, with a click of a button. And the Gen Z, the new generation comes in, they, they, don't need, they never read the manuals of how to turn the iPhone on, right? They don't need manuals. No one need manuals anymore. However, they all know how to use tablets and phones. So what we did, we actually digitalized the paperwork of that workflow or the food flow of food, the cooling period, the warming period, uh, we even automated it with a really nice uh, kind of food probe that tells you, hey, guy, it's time to check the chicken. You then put it in and it, the, whole, the whole handles become green or red. So it's very easy. And I think for adoption, the ease of use is, is critical because then you have more time to, to spend with the clientele with the fact that in the operation room, Everything is hunky-dory. Everything is working to a T uh, because you have the workflow and the sensors working for you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, we mentioned the quality of food. And Julio, I think this is where you step in. Uh, tell them a little bit about, you know, is lettuce lettuce wherever you get it? Or do you have to be careful of certain things? Well, I wanted to go back to what Ali said, which is funny. Because at the at the last food show where we met, uh, most of the chefs and restaurant owners were saying the same thing. We check it when it comes in. Um, and Bob is going to tell you the same thing. You really needed to do your homework way, way. You have to not only worry about who your supplier is, but where your supplier is getting his supply from. So that's where the traceability starts. So, for instance, produce experience. We cannot accept a shipper, a, a grower or a packer, or anybody anywhere around the world that doesn't fill out, that doesn't fit our criteria as to food safety. So we ask for Global Gap, Primus Labs, uh, all these types of certificates. That means they're working, they're doing their due diligence to make sure they're not breaking the cold chain. When the product gets to our warehouse, we don't break the cold chain. We have the ability, because we're SQF certified, Everybody that comes in is, is invited in. You have to put a hair net on, a beard net on. You have to put gloves on. You can only, drivers can only stand in a certain area. So we're following, we're making sure that that cold chain never breaks. We're only buying from people that are already certified. What happens with the restaurant is that restaurants, and Ali is perfect because he said, we check it when it comes in. If the, you know, you're not going to be able to tell whether your baby spinach or your spring mix or your arugula has listeria or salmonella on it. It's impossible. A lot of these food service companies, they cross contaminate. You'll see a truck come in, I'm not gonna name any companies obviously, but they'll have meat, they'll have seafood, they'll have dairy, they'll have produce, they'll have everything on the same truck. The second you open up a truck, I don't care if, if the, 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 the truck is insulated, you could crank it all the way down to 35 degrees if you want on a hot summer day in the middle of Manhattan, when he opens the door, you see all the, you know, everything go out of it. That's where the cold chain gets broken. It's really important for restaurants when they receive their product. I would say you have to certify certain, you know, use a company that only sells produce. Use a company that only sells dairy. Use a company that only sells meat. Use a company that only sells. Nobody, cross-contamination is unnecessary because you're not going to be able to trace it back. You know, there are, let's say you had a quiche and the quiche had spinach in it and eggs in it and bacon in it and somebody got sick from it. Was it the eggs? Was it the spinach? Was it the bacon? Was it the handling of the restaurant? So I would say when you choose your suppliers, ask for things like SQF, ask for things like passive certifications, ask for things like, you know, um, and, and again, and I understand the, the most important thing to any restaurateur is there's their bottom line, right? Um, but I think if you would ask them all, if you would say, hey, listen, if you paid 
50 cents more, say for a kilo of basil, but you knew for a fact that the traceability went back, that this is a safe product that's being used, you know, it's being handled safely, but it costs you 50 cents more. Do you think that the, you know, the, 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 the restaurateur would 99 out of 100 would say, yeah, I'll pay 50 cents extra so I could sleep well at night knowing that my customers are not going to get sick. So Thank that's you. what I would have to say is start way back. Start with your suppliers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we've gone from chef to sensors to produce. I want to go to the front of the house. Uh, Christian, Christian, what instructions do you give to the people who actually actually put the food on my my table uh so i'm a bit of a narcissist i would say uh in a in a couple of different ways um <clears throat> but i'm a stickler for following uh, the rules um you know first thing first to me everything especially you know a, a big learning lesson coming out of the pandemic obviously um has been cleaning and sanitizing and i was always a bit of a clean freak um but i became even more so of a of a clean freak after um the pandemic um so to me it's all about um being set up to win right for my expo person let's say for example for lunch when we, on a busy day here we could do 100 covers uh, two and a half turns um it's all about you know um when the food is coming out right um especially all the the mise en place um is it is it being held at you know in a refrigerator um you know how, the person that's handling it are they changing gloves is the expo person changing their gloves you know when they're expediting are they washing their hands after changing gloves um if they're refilling little ramekins of um mustards and ketchups and, and and things of that nature um you know are they changing their gloves uh same thing with the wait staff throughout the day and the bartenders on the floor and and the prep cooks you know do we have separate tongs for chicken and separate tongs for fish and just you know all of the very basic things um that become all encompassing um to ensure that that the product that we're producing that we're serving to the clients the finished product um that we're checking off all those boxes Okay. So, Bob, Bob, you know, you've heard, we've heard all these different steps. How do we tie this all together uh, and, and make it uh, a cohesive unit? How do we make sure uh, that all these steps are followed? Well, you know, having, having people in charge that, uh, that are certified, that, that, you know, are, know what they're doing, not just um, being there, the whole a bit of active managerial control, uh, running your business, running the floor and integrating front of the house with back of the house. Uh, you know, uh, Julio, like you were saying with separate deliveries, that's wonderful. Not everyone uh, does or even thinks about things like that, but yeah, it, it starts from your purchasing, you know, from approved suppliers and, 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 you know, checking things in, uh, you know, once you get them and that whole, the whole path that things take through our operation, uh, it's so easy to, uh, you know, cross contaminate, but also, you know, recontaminate. You can have a perfectly prepared and handled product. And like, like you know, Christian said in the front of the house, when you're getting all your mise en place ready to go uh, for that expediter or whoever, if we're wiping that plate with a towel that's been compromised, which we often see in the past of places that aren't paying attention, we can have salmonella on our dessert. You know, we can, you know, everything we've done properly uh, can be foiled by one, one stroke of a, a, a towel uh, or a finger or a gloved hand that's been, been recontaminated. So, you know, I always tell people, it's at the molecular level. And that's the, the challenge with food safety is we don't see it. You know, idea with health and safety, everyone's skin their knee, everyone knows, you know, why we have a first aid kit, but food safety, you know, we're, we're industry professionals here and probably everyone on the, on the floor has unfortunately uh, known someone who has gotten foodborne illness, but not a lot of our guests and not a lot of our, our diners that come in. And unfortunately our, our culinarians and our waiters you know they know it by uh, hearing things on the on the news. My God, the cruise ships that just had the outbreaks. So I don't know if you folks heard about that, but 
you know, again, that's close quarters. So it's hard to clean up and, and, uh, and, and stop the spread of some of these organisms. Like the guy was saying with things like listeria and, and stuff that can grow even in refrigerated temperatures. And, you know, Julio, back to the produce, we don't cook our salad and that's a big problem. So really the reputable suppliers for things like our produce chain is, is critical. Um, that, that chicken or that beef that's been bouncing around a tractor trailer with some other, you know, poultry possibly still isn't going to be the end of the world necessarily if we handle it well and, 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 and cook our product properly. But produce is, is very, very vulnerable. You know, you hear about the cases of uh, E. coli on, on romaine and on salad greens. Well, it didn't come from the salad. It came from the, from the, the livestock, but who gets the wrap is the poor produce company and things like that. And you, the operator. So um, it's a big puzzle. It's, um, you know, I think the attention to detail really can't be, can't be said enough uh, as operators. Don't hesitate to, to really just step back and observe, you know, not just take it for granted that the flow is going on. Just see behaviors. Are people washing their hands or are they wiping them on their aprons? Uh, are our sanitation buckets changed properly? Um, and, you know, with, with our logs and uh, like Guy, I'm sure all your, your technology is, is wonderful, but it's like, are we looking at our logs and whether it's like Ali with your paper log or, or, or software logs, are we verifying that what we set out to do is actually happening or do we only worry about it if our, you know, high temperature alert goes off and, and sounds our cell phone when we're, you know, when we finally got home. Yes, so. yes. So, yeah, Larry, if I may, Go uh, ahead. I, I just, just going back to what Christian said, actually, it's, uh, you know, the culture of food safety is really critical. And so what he basically said is that he and the sous chef and everyone is training everyone around the culture of food safety. The issue is when the chef and the sous chef are not there, because, you know, as you know, when you run a, a restaurant, you become a slave to the restaurant. You're working there every day, seven days. And when you're not there, you would like the standard operating procedures uh, to be very clear. When I speak with the workers, they always tell me they want to do the right thing. Obviously, they want to do. Everyone wants to do the right thing. The thing is, is it clear what they need to do to create that food safety culture, right? And it is about culture. And part of it, the standard operating procedure should be a clear workflow uh, you know, that as Bob said, it doesn't need to be only the alert, but it needs to be adopted as a culture. And in order for it to be adopted, we need to cater to the Gen Z, to the new workers, right? In the old days, we use pen and paper. The new days, everyone adopt the new technology. The technology needs to be easy to be adopted. The culture needs to be aligned for food safety. And now you get one plus one equal three, because even if the chef is not there, even if there's no regulation, right? The regulation was put on purpose so people will be trained, right? But you're not working there for the regulation. You're working there for your clientele and make sure that they enjoy the food from a taste and, and, and space perspective. But obviously quality is, is critical there. Yeah, just like everything else that we talk about, it all boils down to training. The training and you know fred has said many times uh we've talked about the uh, the turnover in restaurants and and christian and, and ali we we spoke about it yesterday and we you know we we use my philosophy of the three grades of people the the stars the soldiers and the stumps how do we train and then you know uh the stars are obviously these guys are the brilliant people that come in and out of restaurants. They move out because they want to advance. The soldiers are the people that do the, most of the work and the stumps are the place sitters, the place fillers. So how do we train? And, and Christian, you may want to jump in on this or Bob, how do you train the stumps? The people that you had to have a body there, you put them there. They are the weakest. They, they tend to be the weakest link in this training uh, 
system that we have and they are just as important as the the executive chef because they're touching the food also so how do we make sure that they do the right thing and what steps do you take well not just because i have a training company but i've been in operations for you know 40 plus years as a restaurant owner operator i i've 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 been that seven day person that you just spoke about guy uh and it is difficult to to get those you know placeholders or stumps as you put it uh, on board you know having doing the proper behaviors and having you know fitting into the culture that maybe the chefs and and managers and owners have uh but how do we how do we transcend that to the to the other people i i think there's you know everyone has to be trained and uh there's there's different courses for different levels if you will not everyone has to be served safe manager or New York City food handler certified, but I think it's important to at least get all of our staff uh, the basic training, you know, food handler training or something like that, where they understand in no uncertain terms why we do what we do, you know, because we've all heard I do this, do that. And it, it's good to know why, like I, I tell my clients with, with sanitizer as an example, not to have hand sanitizer in the kitchens, not to install it in your new operations. You can have it out front for your guests because they like to see that. But uh, after the past few years of hearing sanitize, 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 a lot of people, especially the younger crowd who's kind of grown up with Purell, um, they think that's okay to just use sanitizer as opposed to washing our hands. And, you know, it is absolutely not required and it's not a substitute for hand washing. And I can't stress that enough um, let me just break in for a second please. isn't it true that the latest viruses um are impervious to the alcohol they need the soap and water to to take care of it they, they absolutely do and 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 here's the thing there's there's always going to be you know bacterias resisting and and getting around whatever whatever is happening out there there's no substitute for proper hand washing and i and i tell people uh you know I, I can speak freely here because, hey, guess what? If there's a pile of dog poop in the park and we squirt some sanitizer on it, does it make it good? Does it make it okay or clean? No, you know, so uh, it, it might kill a few germs, but, uh, you know, and there's nothing against sanitizer. It's great for your purse and your backpack and keep some in your car or your briefcase, but that's when you're out and about and you don't happen to have a hand sink. But okay. yeah. Thank you, thank example. you. Sure. Christian. So one of the great things about the company that I that I work for is that we hold monthly huddles for different types of they call them safe trainings, for example. Um, so when you ask me how how do I go about training my front of the house team and my back of the house team? Look, I, I, I think everyone is a very important piece of the puzzle. I think probably in the top three most important people in the operation to me are, are the people that that operate the dish machine for me here, um, you know, that are getting the utensils and the plates and turning them over and the glasses and, and all of that stuff. So um, it's, it's from the very bottom to the very top. Um, so we do monthly team huddles. For example, um, this month's safe training was on holding temperatures. Um, and it's 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 a monthly training. They all, you know, they all differ on a monthly basis. Um, but you know, this is a 45-minute team huddle that I host once a month, and it's with the entire team. So I'm bringing them in generally on, on the day that we're closed, which is a Monday. Um, I'll pay them for a five-hour shift minimum that day. So if you know they're not just coming in, so I try to entice them in. And chef will prepare a great meal that day. So we we get them to engage um, within these meetings, and then we do role playing. And then to the to, to guy's point, right? Because the the Generation Z where we're in now, right? It's like how do we how do we engage them? How do we get them to understand um, what's going on? And and did they did they um, take it in by process of osmosis? Right? Was I engaging enough for that huddle? Because some sometimes this stuff can be really boring. Um, but what's really cool is that now the, our trainings come with these cool QR codes um, that they can just, you know, scan on their phone and then it's the course. And if they have any questions or any feedback, um, you know, um, th they can get the answers there as well as a follow-up. So it's not like it's just a one-off for a 30 or 45 minute team huddle. 
they download that QR code, they have the training there as well. So um, that I feel has helped significantly, especially with today's cell phone, you know, where everything's on, on the cell phones. All right, thank you, thank you, Guy. So in your technology, how do you make, how, how do you, what kind of education do you supply with the technology so that everyone from the executive chef to the dishwasher understands what's going on? That, that, that's a great example uh, that, that Christians gave, because what, what we actually do is we take all of that information and digitalize it, including the QR code. One thing that I've learned, you know, my, I have uh, 28 years in supply chain experience. And in the old, old days, we had those uh, big five consulting firms coming in to redesign supply chain, and they left us books over books. And then when something happens, you look, okay, what was there on page 189 that I need to do, right? <laughs> the, the good news is today with the digitalization of those training, and it does not replace those huddles that Christian talks about, because those huddles is what create the culture, and you need to do it. But then you need to also digitalize that process so the checklist is there. Hey, I don't need to remember, the actual sensor will turn red. I looked it up and it will say, guy, you need to put the chicken in the fryer right now for 15 minutes, right? So I don't need to remember all of that and memorize. But then when it reminds me, because I had the training, because I'm all working for quality, right? Because we're all working it together, I know exactly what to expect. And it reminds me. Uh, a lot, a, a, you know, the spam of attention today is so low, right? I am, I, I have that illness as well. My, my people will tell you. <laughs> if it's a boring session, you know, my, my mind will go elsewhere. But if then something is there to remind me of something, then it brings me back to the start operating procedure, to the checklist. And then I go check, check, check. Now, there is what's called pencil whipping. By the way, in the UK, they have a different name for it. But if the pencil whipping is happening, well, then guess what? The next checklist will be violated as well. And so someone else, when they will come in, they will see that, hey, someone just before me didn't do what they needed to do, right? Uh, on top of that, there's the traceability and the flow of food, right? Uh, a chicken that was warm could be then put in the, in the salad if you go through those steps for quality and HACCP compliance. Uh, but you need to know about it rather than just take it and throw it. So also analyze waste as part of the quality, I think is also critical, specifically today when the margin is squeezing, be able to reuse those food in a quality environment instead of throwing it out uh, is, also, is also critical. So we digitalize, to answer your question there, we digitalize that workflow. We take those papers that are on the wall, we do not trust them, we actually keep them there for quality and for culture, but we digitalize them and then we help you go through the process of uh, flow of food the right way. Okay. And, uh, you know, let's go back to basics. Once again, how, uh, Julio, how do you educate the, con the, your consumer, your, your, the restaurateur? How do you educate them that knowing what's coming in is very important? Well, what I do, one of the first things I do with, um, one of the first things I want to say, Christian is great. I love, I, I, let me tell you, you, you got a customer because if you're going through all that, you know, to make sure the, the safety of, of your client, of your customers, I think that's fantastic. I think there should be more, more guys doing that. But what, what we do, let's say on the sales pitch, or let's say um, when we meet from time to time with our customers, we try to explain to them things like, let's say, um, again, I'll go back to, like you said, your lettuce and your spring mix, your baby arugula, your it should be sealed, right? These things should be sealed in what they call pillow packs. It should not be open. Uh, we do a lot of herbs. We probably supply more herbs to New York City than, 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 than a lot of people do. And we have to handle the herbs. It's impossible that herbs would come from, let's say Hawaii or Israel or Colombia, and then every, every, uh, every leaf is perfect. So we have that SQF certificate for, for receiving, for storage, for handling, and for delivery, which is important. Not too many guys in New York City, unfortunately, from the tri-state area have all, have all of that. So what we do is 
we'll receive basil and we invite our customers to come in and see the difference. And we challenge them to go see someone else who's handling uh, their herbs. If, you, if you're a receiver, Chris, and, and, and let's say you get a box of uh, spring mix and that spring mix is open, right? It's open, live leaves out, return it. There, there's absolutely no reason why. Don't ever buy a uh, clamshell unless it's from somebody, you know, the, the claims of triple washing and all these kind of things, I'm still on the fence with that kind of stuff. I really, you know, a triple washing, I'll still wash the, the bag salads here at home. I don't even want to get into organic. You know, that's a whole other uh, issue. I would say if I, have, you know, what I try to explain to my customers is that no matter anything that can get washed, certainly wash it, right? Anything that could be washed, take a couple of teaspoons. So bake cold water, wash them, dry them, or somebody getting, uh, you know, E. coli or something like that. You're also worried about some kind of uh, pesticide, you know, affecting people. So I would say you know, what I tell my customers is, you know, wash it first. If, if you don't, if it's a product like a lettuce or romaine or a spring mix that you don't wash, make sure it's sealed when you receive it. Make sure no one's hands here got into it. And if someone's hands got into your sage or your basil or your whatever, make sure that they're certified to do so and they're handling it correctly. Yeah, uh, you know, it's a, can you go over again that what you consider a good wash for those things? Well, like I said, look, again, our argument in the, in, we've had this argument going on for years and years. Once organic produce got in, everybody automatically thinks organic is so much better for you. And I suggest you wash everything. If you're going to eat the skin on whatever the produce item is, like you're not obviously going to wash a banana because you're going to peel the banana, but you are going to eat an apple. You're going to eat broccoli, cauliflower. You should wash all of it, whether it's conventional or organic. Like, uh, snake venom is organic, but it'll kill you. So <laughs> wash it. <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, I have a farmer that that sold his farm in New Jersey and started traveling the country to go, yes, symposiums all over, because the benefits of organic and conventional are, are very, are very great. There's a very, very uh, uh, big controversy in the, in the produce industry because of it. And they, they charge sometimes three times as higher for organic, and there is no concrete um, evidence that it is much healthier for you. So I would say to anybody, when you receive something uh, that's a leafy green, if it can be sealed, much better. If you're going to anything else, I would certainly wash it. I would wash it. Apples, if you're going to make, you know, a salad that has Granny Smith apples in it, Chris, I would suggest you wash them first. It's it's really, there's a lot of spray washes that, that are readily available. And again, just cold water, a couple tablespoons of baking soda really does the trick. Just try it out, Chris. Throw some berries in a, in a, in a metal bowl, a couple tablespoons of and wash them and you will see the sediment, you will see the dirty water and it's, it's, it's eye opening. Just to add on that, Julio, just one more thing, if may, you know, I may be wrong, but organic also typically will be covered with plastic and that doesn't help the earth. And it's, you know, so uh, they need to be, uh, they need to be wrapped. But what do you think also Julio about the uh, movement to after the pandemic, especially with smaller business, local farms rather than larger companies, and when we talk about keeping the supplier in check and have traceability or food traceability, uh, how do you do that with local people, local farmers that doesn't have all the luxury, but you want to actually sponsor them? And it's also good for part of the culture and, and you know, the, the area. Local, you know, I was always into eating local. I knew a lot of farmers in New Jersey, upstate New York. Uh, it's hard because the the property, the land is so expensive. The, um, you know, uh, the workers are so expensive. So it's really hard to take that, what they call the field heat. So you'll notice if you go to, let's say, your, your ShopRite supermarket when they're running um, the Jersey Fresh programs and you see the green peppers or the eggplants, and then you'll see an eggplant from Mexico, right, right next to it. And the eggplant from Mexico lasts about a week on the shelf without going bad. 
and the local stuff is dead within a day or two. And it's because, you know, the local farmer doesn't have that hydro cool, get that field heat out of the pro out of the product. Um, because even though let's say New Jersey produces more eggplants than anybody on the planet, it's a very short uh, period of time. You know, local is very, you know, very short um, seasons. It's very seasonal. I would say for a restaurant, I love that they buy local. I love to support local farmers, but I would say buy what you're, it's very hard for smaller places to buy only what they're going to use, let's say that day, you know? So it, it does right. not really, somebody that has a chain restaurant, it really doesn't make sense. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's, uh, we're coming to that time. Um, well, I just I want to have a couple, of, couple of questions that came in. I just want to go through them. I think they're important. Okay. Um, could first just, question was Fred, could I just add one quick thing to, please, to Julio's yes, please, comment? Please. You know, great, you know, washing your produce. I just want to remind people or 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 make clear even citrus fruit, which we don't a lot of times some operators aren't washing at the bar or here or there. You're cutting through that skin, which is absolutely not clean, ready to go. And of course, the dreaded melons. Okay, there's salmonella strains that thrive on melon skins, and you know. The, the the mindset of someone that doesn't know is well we don't eat the rind but you're going to run a knife through it and drag all that bacteria right. in so that's it i just wanted to add to that go fred take your questions in yeah uh two quickies uh first one is science there's a there are now things like 3d printed cheesecake with 3d printed food and fabricated food uh what role does food safety play in the production of uh, and, and maintaining safety in that production Anybody have any thoughts on that? Crickets. Not, not really. All right, so it might be a little out there. Then the other, and then the other note that came in, I think it's interesting, is um, Dennis said that he used to work in uh, Howard Johnson's as a kid. Boy, he's dating himself uh, <laughs> in Connecticut, and the waitresses had to wear hair nets. Um, whatever happened to basics like hair nets? And things like that in uh, in food safety. So, uh, um, for for me, my back of the house team, anybody that's on the line, absolutely um, hair nets. Um, I don't have that many ladies uh, like I used to, but the ladies that I do have um, have their hair tied up in a high pony. Um, but I don't require my my servers. Um, yeah. I I think the question there comes. Um, why is men's hair cleaner than women's hair? And um, I think that that's part of the equation there. Um, short, maybe shorter in most cases, or, or it, like in a couple of people in our, our, our round table here, non-existent, uh, but um, it's still hair. So I think equality came into that one. Um, what I want to do right now is, is, is just say one thing and then go around the room because we're in that final 10 minutes. Uh, I, you know, there's been a lot of things thrown out here. And um, what it all boils down to is uh, besides the trust you have in the people that you that are supplying you and doing the work, it all boils down once again to education. And, you know, Christian, I know you have a sports upbringing and I know Fred does. Um, when you join a team, they don't put you in the first day. <laughs> you, you practice, 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 practice. In a restaurant, if you need a dishwasher, you hire them and you put them in. If you need a runner, you hire them and you put them in. So it, it is so important to work with people you know, it, it, in a sports team, you practice preseason, midseason. You practice until you're you're out of the you're out of the game, and um, it has to keep going the same way in a restaurant. We 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 are, seem to be wrapped up in operations when the root of everything is education. So on that note, I'm going to start with Christian for a little bit of a you know a final takeaway that the audience should know. So I'm a fir firm believer of, of cross-training people. Um, when I took over at the museum here 17 months ago, um, for example, I had uh, I inherited a host and a hostess. Um, I inherited a bartender. 
Um, I inherited a houseman who did all of my receivables here on a daily basis. Um, my houseman now is my best server. Um, my host that I inherited is now a phenomenal bartender who gets rave reviews on Open Table and Google and this and that. Um, uh, the hostess, the young lady that I inherited as well. She's one of my top servers as well. Um, I had a barista that I inherited, um, phenomenal barista, but great with clients. And I didn't want her wasting her time serving cappuccinos and Americanos and, you know, pre-made sandwiches when I could cross utilize her on the floor in the restaurant and she could upsell people um, because she's so engaging and she knows food and how it's prepared and she knows how to deliver it. Um, so uh, to me, I think that's the most important thing um, that everyone that plays on your team, um, you know, your starting pitcher could perhaps come in in the ninth inning to close out a game if you need them, right? Or, you know, your uh, your power forward needs to step into the center position and play center for for a quarter. So that that that's my thing. You know, um, I, I, I don't like people just having one title or one job. I like using people um, to the best of their abilities. Thank you. Thank you, Julio. Uh, Chris, that was great. That's great to know. Like I said, you got a customer, man. I think uh, Chris is a guy who gets it right on the restaurant level. Um, I think, you know, a lot of restaurants open up. They're very concerned. Again, it's it, it, a lot of them go out of business within a year. I would suggest anybody, you know, that you know is opening up a restaurant, hire consultants, you know, hire consultants and and help them. You know, what Bob does is fantastic. That's the kind of stuff that the restaurant industry needs. It needs more Christians, you know, guys like this that know how to follow the rules. Uh, I think everybody here is going to feel safe going to have a, you know, a, a, a soup and a sandwich over at over at his places. I would say check your suppliers. That that would be the most important thing for me. Check check your suppliers. Uh, make sure that they're certified. Make sure they don't break the cold chain. Make sure that you know, they're not cross-contaminating. Make sure they're cleaning their trucks. You know, this is a, this is also a very big deal. You know, we have a fleet, we have 14 trucks, four tractor trailers. You know, we have a character, our, our operational director is, is on schedule. Every Saturday he washes, you know, half of them on Sundays, he washes the other half. That's the kind of stuff that's really important. Um, things like medical cards for your drivers. You know, you don't realize it. Maybe the produce or whatever the product is is perfect, you know, but the driver's got a runny nose, you know, and he came into work today. Somebody's got to be accountable. Make sure that those guys, you know, I have a foreman that if he's checking all of his employees on the floor, got 42 people on the floor. If he checks some lady went to the bathroom three times in an hour, guess what? We're going to have to have a conversation with her and say, hey, listen, do you oh. have some kind of stomach or virus or something? What's going on? So those are the things, you know, check your suppliers, check your suppliers, make sure they're doing their due diligence. And, and I think everything will work out uh, uh, in the long run. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Yes. Uh, so I just want to circle back to Dennis's question about the hairnets real quick, because part of that text was about uh, the authorities and, you know, who should regulate this. Officially, anyone in the back of the house should have some kind of hat slash hairnet or combination thereof if they have long hair not hair and even if as as you said even if we don't have hair you should have something on your head because we touch our head you know we sweat and and it's just it's it's all part of the same system um health departments typically aren't very concerned with it and because nobody dies from a hair in the food and people don't usually even get sick from a hair in the food other than grossed out and it's not good for our business. We all can appreciate that. So uh, that's that's my take on that. As far as training, uh, you know, absolutely. I, I certainly agree that uh, Christian, with your extra extended huddle, you know, your your forty five minute on your on your clothes, bringing people in, that's great. Uh, the pre shift meetings every day that people have are 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 fantastic. Uh, but yeah, don't stop training. It uh, you know a lot of people stop training because they figure we don't have time for it, but do it in little little bites, little tidbits throughout your day, you know, a chef demo, little little bit here and there. Uh, if everyone on your payroll is not using the paper towel to turn off the, the faucet, including yourselves, well, that should be step one. You know, that it's, that's basic. And that, and, and that makes it personal to people because remind them, 
when they're not on the clock, when they're at home, when they're in the train station, where they're somewhere else doing that same tactic of using the paper towel to turn off the faucet, it's going to keep them and their families safe and not sick. You know, so it's the single most thing they can do to stay healthy on this planet Earth. So uh, yeah. that's that's it. I'll pass it on to you because we're Thank close you. here. Yep, yep, yep. Thank you. Thank you. Guy, words of wisdom. Yeah, what, what we've learned is that, you know, sensors are important, but they are not the critical piece. The critical piece is the workflow, the checklist, and even more important is the culture of safety and quality first. So uh, I, I will definitely go and visit Christian and Ali. I think that they are building the right culture. Uh, however, with the new generation, with a short of staff, if you need to keep the flow of food under HACCP compliance, Besides checking the supply, because it all starts there, uh, you do need to have a checklist and a workflow plus those sensors to remind people to keep the quality first and always remind training is important, always reminding and then running through the flow of food. So you'll have time to work with the clientele and give them the best of the best. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Fred. Yeah, I'm. Uh, th this is a deeply concerning issue to me of all the things we've discussed, <clears throat> because one of the things we have not talked about is how much it costs to implement many of the programs and ideas that we talked about today. And at the same time, we're running against um, what still is, to some extent, rampant inflation of pricing on everything. So that's a concern. And then at the same time, we're running against this $17 an hour dishwasher piece as well. So we've got an increase in labor. So at the same time, we're asking people to go through additional hoops and additional steps, all of which have to be done in order to keep the food chain safe, et cetera. But the question becomes, who's going to pay for this? And then at the same time, how quickly can technology come into the marketplace to start to control some of these costs as well? So this, yeah. is, a, this is a really, really interesting topic. Yes, yes, I, I, I see food safety too uh, yep. in the horizon. Uh, so guys, uh, keep, keep yourselves available. I, I, I just really want to thank everyone who came out today and uh, to be on the round table, to be part of the audience. Uh, even uh, my friend Dennis, who ac actually asked a question. I love it. I love it. Do we love the participation of the audience? So uh, once again, uh, we're going to be back in two weeks. And I think it's going to be a very interesting topic. Uh, it is what is hospitality in 2023? Dash, is there hostility building in hospitality? Um, so, uh, I know it's a little bit of a, a puzzling uh, title, but uh, tune in and see what we're going to be talking about. And, and once again, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, look for us on YouTube. And I only have two more things to say. Everyone, stay positive, test negative, and I'll see you in two weeks. Bye thanks, now. Guys. Thank you, everybody. Thanks all. Be well. Bye, -bye guys.